15. I'm going to use the egg timer. So I guess I'm the pessimist. Um, but I don't think I am, actually. So we'll see. And I'll do that. Um, so what I want to do is tell a story about democracy. It's going to be the short version of a very long story. Um, I'm going to go back to the beginning, but I think it does say something about where we are now and something about why our politics is the way it is now and not why it's so bad, but why it's so weird. So if you go back to the beginning, ancient Greece, ancient Athens, the people who said democracy would never work, of whom there were many, they said there were three basic things wrong with it. It would mean rule by the poor, because democracy empowers the majority. If there are more of you, you win. And these were very poor societies two and a half thousand years ago. There were more poor people. They said it would mean rule by the ignorant, because very few people had access to knowledge, certainly to education. And they said it would mean rule by the young, because these were societies in which life expectancy was pretty low. These were brutal places to live. There would be many more people in their 20s than in their <clears throat> 40s or in their 50s or in their 60s. You would be governed by 20-year-olds. And Plato, perhaps the best-known critic of ancient democracy, he really picked up on this last point. So in The Republic, his famous takedown of democracy, one of the things he does in that book, is he says democracy is young man's politics. And of course, we are talking about men. And he said, I paraphrase him a bit here, we all know what young men are like. Vain, fickle, often drunk, prone to violence, liable to get into debt, easily led, foolish. So if that's what you want your politics to be like, democracy is for you. If you want your politics to be fickle, slightly drunken, liable to run into debt, prone to violence, young man's politics. And though the Athenians tried to prove him wrong, their democracy failed in the end, it did die. And that argument held for about 2,000 years. That was the winning argument. Democracy can't work because you don't want to be ruled by the poor, the ignorant, and the young. Now, of course, the poor, the ignorant, and the young might not agree with that, but no one was asking them because they weren't writing the books. And then, towards the end of the 18th century, a different argument took hold. And it was deliberately designed to rebut that argument. And this is the argument for what we now call representative democracy, so elections, basically. The people will not rule themselves. What they will do is they will choose or elect people to take decisions for them. And the argument went, even in societies that are predominantly poor and lacking in education and young, those aren't the people who win elections. Because it's really hard to get elected if you're poor. You need money. It's actually pretty hard to get elected if you lack an education. And one of the ironies of this is that even today, the kind of anti-intellectual, rabble-rousing populist politi politicians have an education. Marine Le Pen has a law degree. Donald Trump, if you're wondering, has an economics degree. Nick Griffin, the not at all lamented former leader of the British National Party, studied law at Cambridge University, my university. That one is not on the alumni webpage. <laughs> and you need experience. It's quite hard to win elections if you're in your 20s. Of course, there are always people who buck these trends. There are always exceptions to these rules. But on the whole, the people who win elections are well off, relatively well educated, and relatively old. And the thing about that argument is it didn't just succeed in rebutting the previous argument, it was true. It has always been true. So the average age of the House of Commons today is 50, members of the House of Commons. 50 years ago, it was 50. 100 years ago, it was roughly 50. The average age of the US Senate today is just over 60. 150 years ago, back in the middle of the 19th century, it was just under 60. But this was true even through to the first half of the 20th century in societies that still had a lot in common with the ancient world. They were still, overall, poor, lacking in education and young. So to just give you one snapshot, I talk about this a lot more in my book, 
1930s America, 1930 America, this is the most developed democracy in the world. It's a poor country. The median age is, the, the median, um, sorry, the per capita GDP is around $5,000. If you want a contemporary point of comparison, that's something like Egypt today. So the past really is a foreign country. The median age was around 25. So half the population in America in 1930 were 25 or younger, which is roughly the same as Egypt today. About 5% of people, if that, went to college in America in 1930, and only about 70% of people went to school in America in 1930. Egypt today is a much, much better educated society than America in 1930. And yet, their representatives were not like that at all. So the people in Congress, of course, some of them started out poor. But by the time they got there, they were older, they were better educated, and they were better off. And what that meant was, in 1930s politics, the big divide, the bit that could break in politics, was between the electorate and the people they elected. The reason democracy could fail in the 1930s completely by snapping is that the electorate could decide that that just does not cut it anymore. They're nothing like us. And the majority, which would still have been the poor, the less well-educated and the young, would embrace something else, fascism or communism. That's how democracy used to end. And now, there's been another change. The change now is not in the people in Parliament, in Congress, except in one respect, obviously, and this connects to what Miriam was talking about. They used all to be white men. And now there's still a long, long way to go but of course, the House of Commons, it still doesn't represent the wider population. But compared to the 1930s or the 1870s, it's a lot better than it used to be. There are now people in Parliament who are not all white men. But on the other measures, they haven't changed. They are still average age 50. They are still relatively well off. 91, 92%, I think, of the current members of the House of Commons went to university. They didn't change we changed. So it wasn't that they got poorer, less well-educated, younger. We got richer, older, better educated. Not all of us, not entire electorates, not whole countries, but on average, dramatically, and that is the story of the last couple of generations. Some of it is a story of the last generation. It's a really significant change and what it means is that our politics is different now. So if you think of that age thing, it's always 50 in the House of Commons. That's the age they always are. But we used to be, our median age used to be in the early 20s, and now it's 40. In America, it's 40. In parts of southern Europe, it's 44, 45, 46, 47 in Greece. In Japan now, it's nearly 50. In Japan, they've nearly caught up. The electorate has nearly caught up with the people that they elect. That gap has closed. Not for everyone, of course. That's the median age. So half the population is still younger. But half the population is now older. In education, in 1964, not that long ago, 2% of the British electorate went to university. Even though, in 1964, a significant number of the people in the House of Commons went to university. There was that huge gap. Now, in the under 30 group, it's close to 45% of people who go to university. In some northern European countries, it's over 50%. Over half of the younger population have been to university. We have caught up with them. Not all of us, but some of us. And that is what's different about our democracy. So I'm going to say something now about what I think this means for where we are now. It's not all bad. I mean, it's basically good. <laughs> It's basically better to live in a richer society, a better educated society where people live longer than to live in ancient Athens or even 1930s America. It's much better. It's broadly a good news story, but it's not necessarily had overwhelmingly good effects on our politics. And part of the reason, I think, is that what was the divide, which was essentially between the electorate and the political class, the people in the places where uh, election winners go, parliaments, legislatures, party leaders, prime ministers, all the rest. That was the basic gap. The gap was between 
for want of a better phrase, them and us. Now the gap is within us. The education gap, the generational gap, is not between the electorate and the people they elect. It's within the electorate. And we see this. We saw it in Brexit. The strongest indicators of how people were likely to vote were not gender, were not class, were not income. It was age, and it was whether or not you'd been to university. That's where the gap is, the generation gap, the education gap. Now, in some ways, I think this makes our politics more stable. We are not collectively going to give up on democracy. Too many people are too closely associated with the people who take the decisions, the old, the professional classes, the well-educated. I don't think those people are going to abandon democracy. It's not like the 1930s. I think it's absolutely nothing like the 1930s. Our democracy is not going to snap. But it's got this new division in it, which is a social political division within the electorate. And it is new. There isn't a historical parallel for this. You can't look to past societies and find out what it means to have people 50, 60, 70, 80 divided from people 20, 30, 40, 50, because no such societies have ever existed in human history. So that's the first big difference. The second thing is that that argument for representative democracy doesn't really work anymore. But the, the, the thing on which it was based, which is they've got to be different from us, well, now half of us are like them. So why do we have to let them take the decisions? Why don't we go back to a purer form of democracy? We no longer need to be frightened of the things that people were frightened of for two and a half thousand years. And I think that the growing demands for more direct democracy are something to do with the fact that the basic underlying principle of representative democracy, which was to protect us from the poor, the ignorant, and the young, do not hold anymore. And so representative democracy itself, it's not breaking, but it may be going to morph into something that's much more radically democratic and in some ways much more unpredictable. And then the last thing I'll say is that I think the losers in this are the young. Actually, if you want to gather together a majority of people who didn't go to university, it's not hard. The majority of the British electorate did not go to university. And you can win. Brexit is proof that you can win. There is all sorts of alliances and coalitions that can be made across the income scale. I mean, it's not the, it's not the sense that we all now feel that we are as rich as our politicians, because most of us aren't. And even within the professional classes, there are going to be divisions. But that Plato fear that we're going to be ruled by 20-year-olds, because most people are in their 20s, 20-year-olds are now a tiny minority of the electorate. 20-year-olds cannot amass a victorious majority coalition They've got to find alliances across the generations, and that turns out to be really hard. It is the young, I think, who lose in this. Democracy in its 2,500-year history was politics for and about young people and about the fear of young people. And the biggest change in the last generation is democracy has become politics for and about old people. And just the last thing I'll say, the final injustice here, Imagine a society in which the voting age is 21 and the median age is 21. So the voting age is 21, and then half of the people who live in that society are in their early 20s or younger. That is Britain in 1918, very roughly, when Britain started on this experiment with mass electoral democracy, when the people were properly enfranchised. Now, in that kind of society, there are going to be two huge divisions between the voters and the rich, old, white men in Parliament, and between those two groups and half the population, the children. That was a children's society. Now, that's the majority. If you want to get a majority, you can pretty much get it with children and a few others. And so in a society like that, in a sense, both the electorate and their representatives have got to be aware that half the population don't have a vote. And I think both groups will be sensitive to the fact that someone's got to speak for the children. And now we live in societies where children are a much smaller minority. Young people are screwed by our democracy. And yet we want young people to speak for the children. 
Uh, young people are meant to care about the environment. Young people are meant to care about future generations. Young people are meant to care about the planet. Young people are meant to think for the long term. That's so unfair. Young people should be fighting against old people, and then old people should be caring about the future, because old people are the winners in our politics. I think the, the massive injustice here is that young people are not just getting screwed, but they're also being told they have to care for the children because they kind of are like them. Democracy has gone from being politics for young people to politics for old people. That does not mean it's going to fail. My book does not say it's about to end or snap or break. But it is completely new. Thank you.